Good evening. Welcome to Calvary Underground. And um, I'm Pastor Mike. Just wanted to thank you for joining us. And we're glad that you're here. You can um, just get ready to, to worship the Lord with us. And if you, ha if you need any information um, about our church or about what's going on, um, make sure you check out our website, ccmit.org. You can find our bulletin there, um, other information, things that are upcoming. And um, we're excited that you're with us. And so um, let's pray and we'll get started and uh, we'll worship the Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for just this opportunity to gather in your name. And I pray, Father, that you would just bless us, Lord, whether we're here in the sanctuary or whether we're um, watching online, I pray that you would just meet us here and that your grace would just be upon us and that you would just fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you'd speak to us the things that we need to hear, Lord. We're so grateful, Lord, that we have the opportunity to worship you and to know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.
It's like standing in a hurricane, trying to find the wind, and hoping for your mercy to meet me where I am. It's forgetting that your thoughts for me outnumber the sand. You fill the sun with morning light. You bid the moon to lead the night you clothe the lilies bright and beautiful you've already all I need already everything that I could hope for you're already all I need you've already said
Jesus, we do just thank you. And we thank you that when we know you, you, you can transform us. What a miracle. We just ask that you would help us to not be so distracted with all the shiny objects in the world, Lord. We are so weak-minded. We just ask that you would strengthen us, Lord. Help us to focus on you. Help us to focus on your promises and your word and all that you've done for us. We just ask that you would give us grateful hearts and remind us of your just amazing grace. We just thank you, and we want to worship you tonight, Lord. Just bless us as we go through your word, Lord. Bless Pastor Mike as he delivers it, and just send your spirit to minister to each and every heart. And we just thank you that you can and you will. In Jesus' name, amen. you're here <laughs> for those of you who are here I know most people have kids and so they're not daring to come and it's windy outside so I appreciate um, those of you who are here and I appreciate all those who are online watching us we are in Job chapter one this evening and um, you know you might be tuned in or here because you think oh well they're offering a job but that's not what this is. Um, if you're familiar with the Bible, you might be thinking, oh, we're going through Job because the world's falling apart and everybody's lost everything. Well, actually, I hate to disappoint you, but we're not offering employment unless you want to be a teacher or a daycare preschool teacher. If you want a teaching job, we might have some, some opportunities for you. But that's not why we're teaching this. Um, and also, it isn't because we're going through a difficult time. It's actually what we were going to be doing next because we just finished the book of Esther back in February. And um, things kind of been different and weird since then. So we haven't gotten to this yet, but it was actually back in February that I made this graphic and even this, this uh, beautiful title, Test, <laughs> that we're going to be looking at um, as we go through the book of, of Job. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's appropriate, I think, you know, and I, maybe the Lord's timing as we've been going through some crazy things in life, that we would be going through the book of Job. But um, we, we're in the book of Esther, which ends what, what is known as the historical books of the Bible, and entering into what is known as the poetic books of the Bible. Now, there are five types of books in the Bible, or five sections, I guess I should say. Um, the first section is the Torah, which is the first, or the Pentateuch, which is the first five books, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then um, the second section is the historical books, and that takes us from Joshua through Esther. And then the third section is the poetic books, which is Job through Song of Solomon. And then um, the fourth is the major prophets, which is Isaiah through Daniel, and then Hosea, or excuse me, yeah, Hosea through Malachi is the minor prophets, and not major or minor because they're bigger or better um, and less or anything like that. It's actually just size and volume of the book. But these books of Hebrew poetry start with Job, and that's, of course, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastics, and Song of Solomon. And, and you know, when we think about poetry, you know, it's, you know we, we tend to think in terms of something different. And, and these are not the only books, just by the way, these are not the only books that contain Hebrew poetry. And um, we find Hebrew poetry in the book of Genesis. For instance, um, the Song of Moses is considered Hebrew poetry. Um, we find it in um, Second King, or First Kings, I guess, you know, Second Kings, I guess it would be. When uh, Nathan comes to David and he tells him a parable about the man with the lamb, um, that's written in Hebrew poetry. And, and they know it's Hebrew poetry because they're Hebrews and they know what poetry is. No, just kidding. They know, they know what Hebrew poetry, it's Hebrew poetry because it uses a different form um, than the rest of their writing. And they'll use um, irregular words, you know, like we do, you know, when we sing, maybe you notice that when we sing hymns, which would be considered poetry. Um, sometimes instead of saying, um, we might say ought or something like that, you know, something we don't normally 
um, say, I don't know, that's not probably not a good example, but you know what I'm talking about, you know, little abbreviated words and things like that to kind of fill or make the meter right when it comes to those things. Now, poetry in Hebrew, um, just like in, in, um, in our language, our culture, doesn't necessarily mean that it's allegory, but it could be, right? Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's metered or with a rhythm, or that it rhymes, although that is debatable, and, and there are some scholars who think that it absolutely did. Um, we don't know. But often speaking of man's relationship with God, and uh, oftentimes when we see Hebrew poetry, not always, but most of the time it deals with man's condition and, and, and his relationship to God. Now, Hebrew poetry also it can um, include some parallelism when it comes to um, themes and things like that. Of course, that's pretty normal. But our, our poetry is very much the same in a lot of ways. You know, maybe there's some things that in our culture would be, cons- would be considered poetry in Hebrew that are not considered necessarily poetry in English. Things like maybe Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. You know, something like that would oftentimes um, be included in poetry, although that is an allegory. Um, but we tend to have poetry that we appreciate in our culture that has, you know, meter, rhyme, you know, all those types of things. For instance, one of the, my favorite poets, poems, which I quoted, I think, a few weeks ago, is The Love of God, which, it, which basically goes something like this. Could we with ink the oceans fill, or were the skies of parchment made, were every reed on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, no stre- those stretched from sky to sky. So we, we hear that type of poetry, and usually when I, when I give that poem, people come up to me and say, oh, what was that poem, and where can I find it, you know, because it's just it's powerful. It gives us chills. We think about it, you know, oh, man, the ocean's being drained dry just to write God's love, you know, stuff like that. What's interesting, and this is something that I know about poetry, is that it does not translate. And so when we think about what we're reading in the book of Job, it isn't as beautiful or in, in whatever way or whatever form, whether they read it um, with a metered you know, type of sing song or something like that, the way that they would recite it, which they did, um, it, it doesn't come out the same way in English. Now, I know this. And when I was in Romania... I was thinking about this because I was thinking as I'm going through Ephesians with the Romanian pastors, I thought, man, that poem would be perfect in this point, at this point in the, in the thing. And so what I did, I, I knew better than just to try to throw that poem at them, you know, could we with ink the oceans fill? How do you even translate that? As you're a translator, you're like, what does that even mean? You know, that's the weirdest way, you know, I've ever heard anybody speak. So and what I did was I wrote out that poem and I gave it to Chipri. Chipri was my translator. I said, Chipri, can you translate this in some sort of poetic form into Romanian? And he's looking at it, he's like, I think so. And so he took it and he spent till like two in the morning, because I was going to be doing it the next morning. He spent like till two in the morning and he nailed it. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, I don't know, because I didn't, I, I couldn't tell what he was saying. I'm sure he was saying what I was saying just in Romanian. But I, I just gave the poem, and, and, and this is what's crazy about it. I gave the poem, and then Chipri, he, you know, he's just waiting for me like normal, and then he just nails them with this poem that they'd never heard before. Nobody in Romanian had ever heard this poem before, and they were shocked. They were like, how did he come up with such a beautiful poem out of whatever he said? You know, and the, the people who could speak English and Romanian were completely stunned. Um, but it, it does. It takes a lot of it takes a lot of effort, a lot of preparation, and in order to take something that's beautiful in one language and make it beautiful in another language, you have to be some sort of a genius. And Chipri obviously is. You know, he learned speak, to speak English, and um, he, he's their best translator. He, he learned it from watching cartoons. He told me <laughs> he learned he learned English and Italian from watching cartoons. So that's a tip for you if you're learning a new language. But but this is something we need to think about. When we think about Job and the implications of the things that we're learning within the book of Job, it's meant to draw you to an emotional state. 
just like any poem or piece of, of or song, you know, would as it's, it's drawing you in. Victor Hugo said the book of Job is perhaps the greatest masterpiece of the human mind. And, and if you think about just the literary form, and it is a narrative, you know, and that's what's different about it, because we don't usually think of narratives as poems, and, I, and there are some that are, you know, I don't really have any long ones in English that I can think of, but there are some narratives that are, are poems. Um, what is that one about the, the ghost of somebody who was in Alaska? I can't remember what it is, but anyway, um, there are some that are narratives, but, but not usually. And, and so when we think about just the scope of the story, it is really an epic. You know, the, the book of Job is, is pretty amazing. Now, having said that, this book isn't in sequence. As you probably understood, as we've been going through the books of the Bible, um, we have Genesis through Deuteronomy, which are in sequence, and then Joshua and Judges, which are in sequence, and then First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, or First and Second King, First and, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, which are in sequence, First and Second Chronicles, which isn't. Remember, it jumps back to pretty much. First Kings, and tells the story from the chronicles of the kings of Judah from Judah's perspective, or maybe from God's perspective. And then you have First and Second Chronicles, um, is it Ezra? Yeah, Ezra. Ezra is, is also not in chronological order. And then, um, then you have Nehemiah, and then you have Esther, and, and these are all not in chronological order. And then you have Job, and Job actually fits somewhere from what we can tell. And, and it doesn't really place it in a specific time within the book. It doesn't say, you know, at the, the beginning of this, or this person was the king of anything, you know, nothing like that. Um, but it does give us some, some contextual clues that place it about Genesis chapter 11. And so when we look at Job, Job was not a Jew, you know, and, and he wasn't an Israelite. In fact, he wasn't even related to the family of Abram uh, or Abraham, and he, he probably wasn't even within that clan. He's from a place that we really don't know much about. The internal clues give us um, this idea that he was long before Moses, and so that means that Job would have been the oldest book in the Bible. In fact, it's probable that Abraham maybe came into a relationship with God by reading the book of Job. Who knows? I mean, that's speculation. But it's very possible that Abraham had a copy of the book of Job in whatever form it was in, whether it was, it was um, written down or whether he had it through oral tradition. I don't know. But in the book of Job, we see that Eliphaz references the flood. The fall is referenced. The flood is referenced. Job sacrifices as the head of his family, as we'll see in this chapter, which is something that was practiced in Genesis chapter 4, in Genesis chapter 12, and Genesis chapter 15. Um, and so after Moses, you remember that after Moses, this was something that was given to the Levites to do. And the head of the family would bring the sacrifice on behalf of his family, but the Levites would do the sacrifice. It's not, not the case in Job. Um, Job's daughters received an inheritance along with his sons in Job 42.15. Um, a patriarchal pra practice, but not something that passed on with the law of Moses. That would go to the eldest son. Um, Job's wealth is determined by flocks rather than money. And this is a huge clue because not long after the time of Abraham, they started using um, shekels and denarii and other things like that. In Job, um, they didn't use, you know, basically it, talk, it talks in his, his uh, wealth in terms of his flocks and his herds and his servants. Um, and then the one, one mention of money in Job 42, um, 11, it mentions um, a keshta, which means a piece or weight of, you know, money. And it's not, so it's in something that was also used in Genesis when Abraham bought a field. And so probably around that same time. Musical instruments that are mentioned, organ, harp, and timbrel are all instruments in early Genesis. And Job, also the length of his life. Now remember that Job at this time had 10 completely grown children. And then after he goes through his ordeal, at the end of the book, he lives another 140 years. Now if you understand anything about the curve of attrition or the rate of decay, um, when you think about, you know, okay, let's just, just use an example. Let's say um, an animal is, sh is shot and it lays on the ground. Or maybe it's a cow that's out in the field. You ever seen those cows? 
They're all <laughs> round and bloated. You know, they look pretty much like a cow for quite a while. And then, you know, for a couple of weeks, and then they pop, and then it just, you know, all of a sudden it dehydrates, and it starts, you know, the, the rate of decay is pretty, pretty quick, right? And it kind of goes down like this. And then, it, you know, all the flesh rots off, and then it kind of levels out, and you got bones that will sit there for years, right, before they turn to powder. See, it's the same thing with just about anything. Let's say that you're somebody in marketing, and, you know, the law of diminishing returns. You put out a big ad campaign, and your ad's doing really well. You have a lot of sales, and then the sales start to fall off as your ad stops, and then... Somebody clipped it, and a few people, you know, keep buying it, you know, long term. So same rate of decay. Same thing as you look at those curves of attrition, you see the same thing when you look at Genesis. People live 900 years, 800 years, it starts to fall off, and then it kind of levels out at 100, you know, 80 years, you know, 70 years. You know, it's kind of just kind of same thing. And so if you, if you follow the rate of attrition... And an age of 200 to 225, which is what Job would have lived to, that puts him right around the age of Abraham. You remember Abraham lived um, over 200 years. His, uh, Terah lived 225, I think. Abraham lived about 200 years. And then his son lived 175, something like that. But it just, and then it kind of leveled out at 100 years old. People were living 900 years. Now people live not, not quite 100 now. And that's been going on for a long time. So the same type of a thing. And so if you date it by that, you find it's going to be right around that same period. Um, again, no mention of the law, no mention of the Torah, no mention of the Levitical rules, no mention of any of those things in the book of Job. So obviously, it predates the book of Genesis past chapter 12 or 13, somewhere in there. Now, um, Job's impressive, though as an individual, because he doesn't have the light of the Old Testament, nor does he have the light of the New Testament, and yet he has a pretty amazing relationship with God. You know, apart from all that, we don't know what type of light they did have, and maybe they knew a lot more of, about things that we don't know about back then, um, had a greater understanding of, of certain things that we don't understand, but certainly a lot has been revealed in terms of the New Testament and the Old Testament um, in, in relation to a person's relationship with God, and even within the book of Job that we find, um, that you, you'll you find clues and um, things in, written in the book of Job. They're written nowhere else in the Bible except that you find those assumptions within the New Testament, you know, loudly proclaimed by Paul and, and other others, um, even though nowhere else in the Old Testament mentions those things. And we'll, we'll see some of those things as we go through. Now, Job was a real person. You know, some people have said he wasn't. But we know that in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14, when Ezekiel is bringing his indictment against the people of his day, he says, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver them only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. So Ezekiel 14, 14. And then James 5, 11, in the New Testament, Job is mentioned. Um, James said in verse um, James 5, 11, he says, Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. And so he, the writer James, James says, you know, you obviously have heard the story of Job. You, you see from this, we learn from this story, this true story, that God is merciful and compassionate to those who persevere. And we talked about that a little bit um, in the book of Revelation, didn't we? You've kept my command to persevere. Now, think about that in terms of Job's life. If you are familiar with this story, that's a little frightening. Um, and if you're not familiar with the story, you'll see what I mean. But, but the theme of this book is that God is good and worthy of our love and devotion regardless of what we might go through in life. And I know that that is a crazy thing to think about. But God is good. He's worthy of our love and devotion, no matter what we might go through in life. And that he has good intended towards us and is worthy of our trust, even when we can't see the full picture. And, and that's going to be true in our lives. We're not going to see the full picture always. 
Sometimes we'll be left completely in the dark. God does not owe us an explanation. You know, we may see horrible things. Our life may come apart at the seams, but God doesn't owe us an explanation, nor does he always give us one. But he will always give us, if we look to him, he will always give us consolation, right? And we can always we can always fall back on Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. I know that that doesn't necessarily help us just understanding that, but we do have those promises, you know, that he gives us peace that passes understanding, that he gives us strength in the midst of, you know, the, the difficulties, and that we can trust in the Lord with all our heart, lean not on our own understanding, and all our ways acknowledge him, and he will direct our paths. I mean, we have all these promises that, that give us these, uh, this understanding. And so that's basically what the theme of the book of Job is. So let's jump in. Um, Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Now, this is thought, us is, is a place that we really don't know. You might see, you might see us in your Bible um, atlas in the back, your little maps in the back, and it will always say, us, question mark, <laughs> because we really don't know where us is. However, we do kind of understand that us must be somewhere close to the Sabaeans, which would have been kind of south, north of Egypt, but kind of south in the area of Jordan, um, that, you know, kind of where uh, Petra, you know, the Sabaeans and the Edomites settled that whole area. And so they were nomadic tribes at this time before they'd settled into cities. And, and so that's, it would be between there and Mesopotamia, where the Chaldeans were from. So we kind of, you know, triangulate and figure that they're probably right you know, probably right next to where current day Israel is, somewhere in that region um, of the world. Not 100% sure, but that's kind of where um, we believe us must have been. And he was blameless. This, this doesn't mean without sin, but Job was a man who lived with integrity. Um, it means he was, he was honest in his dealings, um, and upright means he was honest in his dealings and, and um, didn't cheat other men. And then he feared God. He had tremendous respect for God, and he had a relationship with God. Now, it's, it's weird to us because we don't think of people in that era as having a relationship with God, I think. You know, we read the Bible, and it's like Adam and Eve blew it, and nobody really even knew God until Noah, right? And then Noah, and then, then, then you know, Babylon and all that mess, you know, and then you have finally Abraham, and like nobody else in the world knew God. No, it's not true. There were people who knew God, and just because God chose the Jews or Abraham's line to be the one who would bring in the Messiah into the world didn't mean that there weren't groups of people that didn't understand and know God. In fact, there's, there's evidence that's really interesting that Shangdai in China was the monotheistic God of the Chinese, and they worshiped a, a a supreme God, you know, and then it later on went into Taoism and Buddhism was introduced and Confucianism, all these different um, groups came in and, and kind of com- confused all of that. But the emperor of China, um, Shang, Shang um, dynasty, sacrificed to this supreme, the king would sacrifice an oxen on an altar to this supreme God. And they found records that that happened long before even the Shang dynasty. So it's interesting that there were groups of people around the world. And if you look at the world anthropologically and you find these pockets of people, oftentimes, not only will you find a tradition within these people that they came from people that came from the flood, You know, every culture in the world has a flood tradition, but also um, oftentimes their oral history or even written history, if they have it, will point back to a time when they knew God and somewhere along the line they lost God. You know, that's true of the Sable people in northern, um, northern, uh, what's that country? 
India. Northern India, um, it's true of the Wa people, you know, in China, you know, in the, um, the Karen people, actually, um, were worshiping the supreme God. And it wasn't until um, Adoniram Judson had translated the Bible into the Burmese language that the Karen people um, found out about this, that, that a book had come with, with knowledge about the true God, and the whole group of people embraced it and became Christians. You know, this is amazing how God has placed his witness in all these places around the world. Even in, um, even in ancient Athens, and if you remember the story, um, it was uh, recorded by Plato and Aristotle um, that there was this plague that came upon Athens and if you remember how that whole thing went down, that they brought all these gods into the city of Athens to try to stop the plague. They knew they defended a god. Um, he had, the king of Athens had committed treachery against the king of Mesopotamia. And so he was trying to stop this plague that had broken out, probably COVID-17 BC. <laughs> but it was, it was uh, or 600 BC, really. Um, but this, this plague had broken out, and so they were trying to stop the plague, and so they went to the Oracle of Delphi. She said, do you need to get this guy, um, Epimenides, from Crete? And so they went and found him, brought him back to Athens, and he helped them stop the plague by making altars to the unknown god. And when they sacrificed to the unknown god, believing that it was a god who was a good god, otherwise it doesn't matter, Right? and that he would forgive them for not knowing his name, they sacrificed to this unknown God, and the plague was lifted. Well, God had placed that witness in that culture so that 600 years later, Paul the apostle could walk in, and he says, this unknown God that you worship ignorantly is the God of heaven and earth. And he quotes Epimenides, when he says, in him we live and move and have our being, for we are his offspring. So all these things have come together, and God places his witness in these different places, and people that didn't know the God of the Bible back then, their witness carried forward, and oftentimes even now when missionaries go to places, they find that there's some sort of prophecy or witness of the true God that the people understand that they've lost, but these missionaries bring it, and it fits right in with what you know they're tradition told them would happen. It's just amazing. A great book on that is um, Eternity in Their Hearts by Don Richardson, if you've never read it. But anyway, so here's a man who truly did know God. He was a, God, a man who feared God, shunned evil, and he was blameless in his days. It says, verse 2, it says, he, he, and, se, ha, um, and seven sons and three daughters were born to him. And, you know, here's a man who had a, a large family, and ironically, you know, and this isn't something that's super typical within these ancient stories, he had, guess what, one wife, just one wife. That's all he had. Not a bunch. Of, he's very wealthy, as we're going to see. He could have had a lot of um, a lot of uh, wives if he wanted to. He could have had a harem if he wanted to, but he didn't. He had one wife, and he had ten ten children. So a man wealthy in family. And um, as a man, you know, myself with six children, I feel that I am happier than a man with six million dollars. And the reason is, is because a man with six million dollars wants seven. <laughs> it's funny because Shannon, she's like, honey, I need to go see my OBGYN. I was like, why? And she says, I think I might be pregnant. And I was like, what? <laughs> I'm 40. How old am I? 48? 40, 46? I don't even know how old I am, honestly. And she, she's like, yeah. And, and she's, she wasn't, you know, but that was, that was recently. And I was just like, <gasps> you know, she's like, maybe I'm going through that change. I was like, I hope so. <laughs> you know, it's, oh, man, what, what would a guy do? But, um, 
So seven sons, seven, of course, the number of completion. And in, this is, you know, in a way, it's poetic. You know, seven sons. He has seven sons. He's complete um, in his sons. He has three daughters, which brings the number to 10, which is also a number of, you know, in the Old Testament, there's these numbers, you know, people kind of make significant. Sometimes they probably aren't. Sometimes they probably aren't. But um, oftentimes considered the, the number of authority or law, of course, the, the 10 can't, 10, um, Ten canons, the Ten Commandments, and and then also a number of completion. You know, ten can also be considered a number of completion. And then he loved his kids. This guy loved his kids, so he's wealthy, wealthy in family. And in verse three it says, also his possessions were seven thousand sheep. You know, for wool and textiles, things like that. You know, he had all these sheep and also for food, um, three thousand camels. Um, these were like, you know, the SUV of the Middle East, you know, and still are to this day. You know, these, these dudes can go a long way through the desert without needing a drink of water. And so these were your, your this is, you know, a fleet of trucks, basically, 3,000 um, three F-350s, uh, 500 yoke of oxen. So this is, this is 1,000 oxen because 500 yoke is 1,000. So you have each yoke has two oxen. Um, to plow and to cultivate the ground. 500 female donkeys. This is like your Audi, you know? <laughs> a female donkey was um, a smooth ride, you know? You, a horse is kind of, you know, dangerous, and they're kind of rough to ride on, but a, a donkey just kind of trots along just real nice, and when it, it gallops, it's just more of a jiggle than it is like a cluck, 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 you know? It's not, it's a pretty, and you know, in the, in the ancient world, they, a donkey was considered the premier animal to ride. Uh, a very large household, and this is not speaking necessarily of his children, but this is speaking of his male and female servants. So a very large household probably had up to a thousand servants or more, you know, in his household. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And so nobody in his region in the East were wealthier were greater. He was kind of a sultan, you know, if you will. And so he was wealthy materially. Again, not with gold and silver. It doesn't mention that amongst his wealth, which is also that one of those clues. But it, wealth was measured in commodities and in, in souls, in, in family, which is what they would consider their servants. So thousands of, of um heads of cattle, thousands of servants, verse 4, and his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So this truly speaks of his, the wealth of his family. You know, it, all of his kids loved each other. <laughs> you know, it was one of those things where they could all get together. You know, I have family like this, you know, um, my sister lives in Meridian. I have another sister who lives in the Grand, but she's moving back, and a brother that lives in the Grand. And you know, we'd always get together for birthdays and all that. You know, and we we figured it out that we have um, somebody in our in that group of family. We have somebody has a birthday every single month of the year, and which is crazy. And in my family, no nobody except for Anaya, the baby, and Isaiah, the oldest, the my youngest and my oldest, um, share the same birth month. So that's eight of us, and so seven months of birthdays, which is good, but is kind of exhausting, you know, to be honest. But anyway, so you have, um, you know, all these families that all love to get together, grown children, their families are good boys, because not only do all seven of the boys get together, probably on their birthdays, so, you know, it doesn't tell us, it just says appointed day, um, maybe they just picked one day a month or one day a week or something like that where they all got together. We don't know, but it probably was their birthdays that everyone would come to that person's house. They'd make a big feast, and they were good boys because they even invited their sisters to come along and feast with them. They'd eat, and they'd drink wine, and they'd just celebrate um, each other. Now, notice this, verse 5. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course, and Job would send and sanctify them. Now, set them apart. That's the idea. And he would rise early in the morning and offer a burnt offering according to the number of them all, all ten of them. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. And so Job acting as the priest of his family, and this is what the patriarch would do. 
Of course, after the law of Moses, you know, the, the patriarch would bring the sacrifice to the temple or to the tabernacle, and the priests would do it. But in those days, before the law of Moses, every man would act as a priest for his own home. Now, that actually is kind of reverted back to that in these days, where we don't have um, a intermediary where we take our sacrifice before a priest at the temple to have it sacrificed, but rather Jesus has become our sacrifice and it's for us as, as fathers of our households to bring our children to the Lord and to intercede for them through prayer. And, and I think that that's probably one of the most powerful things. Um, we see the example of Job here. We see his love for his children, that he would spend that time to go before the Lord for each of his children. Now, of course, Job understood that, you know, hey, me sacrificing an animal for them isn't going to forgive their sins. But he, he was basically going on behalf of his children by faith, knowing that, you know, I can't do anything to save my children, but God can. You know, I, I can't necessarily reach them. And, and, you know, and I think every time um, a parent sees their child leave the house and they're, you know, out on their own, you know, what do we do? We, we get on our knees and we, we plead with God, Lord, please. And we wouldn't do that if we didn't think it could benefit, right? If we didn't think that there was benefit to that. You know, and we, we hold on to those scriptures, you know, that talk about, you know, uh, train up a child in the way they should go. When they're older, they will not depart from it. And those types of things, because we have a deep concern and a love for our families. And, and, and certainly that was true with Job. I mean, you think about the energy that this would have taken to, to pull out all of these sacrifices for each of his children every time they got together and had a party you know, because sometimes during a party, you know, they're drinking a little bit. There could be levity there. There could be, you know, um, foolishness. And so he would just intercede before the Lord for each of his children. It says, verse 6, this is where it gets weird. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. It's a little chilling. So you, you imagine the scene, the heavenly scene, God sitting on his throne. You have um, the angels, and that's what we're talking about when we talk about the sons of God, the angels gathering around, the sons of God gathering around the throne of God, and, and then Satan also came among them. Satan's there. This fallen being. Now, a few things maybe that are new for some of us in this passage. Sons of God is probably not something that we're used to. Um, there's only a few places in the Bible where we see this phrase. And so we tend to have one passage where we see the Son of God, you know, kind of um, used a lot. John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life, right? So we, we think, think of that. And, and so when we hear something else called a son of God, no, Jesus is his only begotten son. Well, how can these be sons of God? Well, you got to remember that that was, he's the only begotten son. In other words, Jesus is the only conceived and born son of God. Every other son of God, and the, the, the Hebrew is B'nai Elohim, is a son who was created by God. And that's why um, in Luke 3.38, Adam is also called a son of God. There in Luke 3.38. Because God didn't just have Jesus as his son, but actually every being he created directly would be considered a son of God amongst the angels and amongst um, the first man. Then, of course, Eve came from Adam. So Adam was the only um, created son of God in terms of human, and Jesus was the only begotten son of God in terms of human. And so, um, you know, kind of a new, maybe a new concept for us to think about. But when we look at the Bible, there's a few places where the sons of God 
are used um, in terms of angels. And we find that here in Job chapter 1 and then again in Job chapter 2. And we find it again in Job um, chapter 38. Um, in Job 38, it says this, When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And then again in Genesis chapter 6, we see that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful and took wives to themselves. And that's kind of a you know, kind of a, a reference to a fall that happened there in Genesis chapter 6. So in, in this passage, it's talking about, it's speaking about angels. Another thing that might surprise us is we don't tend to think of Satan as somebody who's in heaven, right? I mean, it's like, he's out of here, right? No. In, in fact, we might even mistakenly think that Satan's like down in hell with a little pitchfork you know, red horns and ruling down over hell, right? No. No, in fact, Satan doesn't go to hell until he is chained and put in, uh, you know, the bottomless pit for a while, for a thousand years, and then he breaks free and, or he's loosed, and then he's thrown into the lake of fire, which is the ultimate or the, the final um, second death, a place designed or created for the devil and his angels, Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 25. But in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, this is, again, we're looking at the last seven-year period of human history as Revelation chapter 12 kind of unfolds the narrative. And Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, it says, Then I heard a loud voice saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. So it isn't until the end that Satan is booted out of heaven. In other words, Satan has access to heaven even today. Until that period when he is cast down to the earth and then his wrath will be great because he knows his time is short. Three and a half years. And so that's, what, that's what's going to happen in the future. So this is a very dark scene. We have the angels, and then Satan shows up. Satan with the angels. And, and, and again, I want to just reiterate, Satan is not, absolutely not, the equal opposite of God. You know, we, we tend to think that as kids. You know, I, these are all the things I thought as kids, so I'm just trying to, you know, dispel all my childhood understanding of, of the cosmology for all of us today, because I just figure you, you, you were just like me in that. But you have Satan, who is not the equal opposite of God. It's like God's all good, and Satan's all evil, and God's powerful on the good side, and Satan's powerful on the bad side. And Satan is puny compared to God. And Satan only exists and is allowed to exist because God has a reason and a purpose for him, which is, you know, maybe we'll talk about in just a moment. But, but Satan, um, he is still in this narrative doing the job that he is doing now, which is accusing the brethren. We see that, you know, that's one of those areas that I was talking about where we see in in the old or in the New Testament, this reference of him being the accuser of the brethren, and we see a, a personal example of it here in the book of Job. So in verse 7, it says, And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and walking back and forth on it. So we have to understand that Satan has dominion over the earth. Where did Satan get dominion over the earth? That's another thing that a lot of people don't think about, you know. We know that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, right? But God gave dominion over the earth to who? You remember Genesis chapter 1? Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, everything that creeps on the ground. It's all yours. Subdue it and be fruitful and multiply. He gave it to Adam. And so Adam is in charge. He's the king of the world, Right? Not you, Adam. <laughs> he starts shaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember, Adam made a big mistake. His wife submitted to the enemy, the devil, and then he submitted to his wife and ate of the fruit. And what that did, um, I guess transactionally, if that's even a word, what, what the transaction that took place there is that 
the man and the woman became slaves to sin when they knew all of a sudden knew good and evil, but they also became slaves to the devil. They became subordinates to the devil who took that authority from them. And so this, the scripture, he, it tells us this. Remember what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So this is what Satan is doing. He's trying to destroy humans. He hates humans. Isaiah chapter 14 tells us that he wants to be like the Most High. Well, what did the Most High do? He created a man. How did he create the man? In his image and in his likeness. So now Satan, who is this beautiful angel, Ezekiel 28, tells us that, he's, that, that, that he was beautiful and perfect in every way, that he had pipes and timbrels built into his body, set in his body, and, and that he was perfect in every way until iniquity was found in him. And, and so he, his desire is, I want to be like God, and then he sees God make a man who is, in a way, like him. And his jealousy was burned. And it seems, because it talks about him being in the Garden of Eden, that he was perfect, walking back and forth amongst the fiery stones, that he was perfect in all of his ways until iniquity was found in him. It seems it was at that scene, there in Genesis chapter 3, when he comes as a serpent and deceives a woman, that that was the moment of his fall. Because he was in the garden, perfect, before the man and the woman probably were placed in the garden. And when he saw them, he was jealous. And that, that led forth to this whole scene unfolding and mankind falling into his trap. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4 says, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Or good news. If our, if our good news is hidden, it's hidden by, to those who are perishing. Why? whose mind the God of this age <clears throat> has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So Satan, who is considered, the New, the new King James says the God of this age, the Old King James says the God of this world, um, kind of the idea is that he's the God of this present time, you know, over the world, and it has blinded the minds of people so that they wouldn't believe. You know, it tells us, Paul told Timothy that he's taken them captive to do his will. You know, and, and that we need to be patient with them and, you know, able to teach, you know, not frustrate, not to argue or quarrel with them, but to be patient with them, you know, that they might um, be granted repentance. And that's, that's the, the scene that we're in. We're in this place where people have been taken captive to do his will, and we as Christians have the good news, have the light of the glorious gospel. We're trying to share it with them, praying, interceding that God would grant them repentance to turn from their sin, that they might be released from the captivity that they're in. I, I love how, the way Del Tackett put it in the Truth Project. He says, when we look at nonbelievers, we should see them as POWs, prisoners of war that the enemy has taken and put them in shackles. And then, of course, 1 John 5, 19 tells us, we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And so we're living in a world that God had given to our ancestor Adam, which he lost at the fall, and so now we are been born with a sin nature on the wrong side of the tracks, under the bondage of the devil, de devil, 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 and we... Through repentance, because we've been granted repentance, the light shined on us, we opened our eyes to it, and he saved us by faith, gave us the right to be called, ch called children of God, and now we want to be able to shine that light to everyone else who's under the sway of the wicked one. But you'll notice in this scene that, that Satan, of course, isn't all-powerful. He's not more powerful than God. He's very limited, and we're going to see that as we look at his relationship with God. He's not all-powerful. He's not omniscient. He's not all-knowing. He doesn't know everything. He's not omnipresent. He only can be in one place at one time. You know, you hear people talk about, oh, the devil's really been on me. 
Probably not. You know, he's probably dealing with, you know, like world leaders, you know, <laughs> you know, not you um, or me. You know, it's probably some minion, you know, demon who got demoted that's bothering you. You know, <laughs> so you, you don't have to worry about that type of stuff. But but he, Satan is limited. And, and if, but of course, we also kind of understand, you know, and we have this we have this verse. It talks about the dragon drew a third of the stars to follow him. And of course, stars is another name used for angels. You know, we, we saw that back in Job. Um, what was that verse? Job 38. The morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. Um, you know, it's, it's parallelism. They're, it's talking about the same thing. You know, um, the morning stars and the, the sons of God, same thing, angels. Um, and, and so when it talks about him drawing a third of the stars, it's understood that a third of the angels followed Satan. So, you know, that would be his demonic realm. You know, the Bible is not super clear on how principalities and powers and dominions and evil powers in dark places work. We don't really understand how the ranks of those things work or, or how many of them there are. Um, nothing like that. But we, we do understand that sometimes we are oppressed. So it, it says in verse 8, it says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil? So it, it's not just that Job is described like this by the author of the book of Job, which maybe was Job, and we don't know who wrote the book of Job whether it was one of, his, one of his children later on or whether it was Job himself or whether it was one of his friends, we don't know. But God says the same thing about Job that the author of Job says about Job. And God's bragging on Job. And this is an irritant to Satan, and God knows it. Satan wants every single person on the earth to be under his dominion, under his thumb. But God is greater, right? And God has provided for mankind through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to cover what happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve took the fruit from the tree and the penalty was death, Jesus became that lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world that would cover the sins of mankind. Therefore, anyone who accepted the payment that was given to them through Jesus could be set free. Just like in the laws of the Jewish people, if your closest relative came and bought back your um, debt, you know, paid off your debt from slavery and bought back your land, then you could go free. And Jesus did that. Jesus bought back the earth by shedding his blood on the cross. He died on a tree to make up for what was taken from the tree, which, pen which penalty was death, right? So Jesus died on the tree to die for Adam's sin and to pay for every single, not just Adam, but every single person who sinned, even if they didn't sin according to the likeness of Adam, it tells us in the book of Romans, that his payment was sufficient for every single person who would ever live. But the thing about the kinsman redeemer is that you, if he paid for your sin, that doesn't mean your kids go free. He had to pay for their sin too, right? And so every single person has to be paid for, but not only does every single person have to be paid for, but every single person has the choice as to whether or not they want to go free or not. And that was the law of the kinsman and redeemer. If you say, no, I love my master, I want to continue to be a slave, then you could go have your ear pierced and be a slave forever. Which is kind of chilling when you think about that payment. Because it's not like, I love my master, he's good to me, like we would think of somebody like God, but I love my master, the devil, because I like the darkness. You know, and that's exactly what John chapter 3 says. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And they would not come to the light lest their deeds would be exposed. And so, <clears throat> um, here's a man who lives in Satan's dominion, and yet if, instead of going with the flow of what came naturally, which is our sin nature, he decided to fear God and shun evil. And as long as there are people who will rebel against their sinful nature and look unto God, who will, who will surrender themselves to Jesus, he will deliver them um, from the wrath to come. And, and that, that irritates the devil. He does not like it when people come, when people get saved. He hates that. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? 
Isn't that interesting? God blames, excuse me, Joe, excuse me, Satan blames God for making Job love him. For doing what he needed to do so that Job really wouldn't have a choice but to love him. I mean, goodness, God's so good to me. Why wouldn't I? I don't know about you, but I didn't accept Christ because I thought that my life would be easier when I accepted Christ. I didn't. I, I just That's something that never actually crossed my mind. In fact, I thought in a way I was ruining all of my fun by accepting Christ. But, but in my mind, as an 18-year-old kid, you know, I thought to myself, okay, God's all-powerful. He's the one in charge. Satan is going to go end up in hell. And so I probably better join the winning side. <laughs> you know, I, I, I better surrender myself to God and throw myself upon his mercy. And I didn't really understand that God was loving and merciful and gracious and all of that. I thought this is going to mean difference, a change. But, you know, also when I came to God, I didn't think that I could actually, you know, make the changes I needed to make to be able to please God. And so I just kind of threw myself on his mercy and say, God, you're just going to have to do this because I can't. You're going to have to make me obedient to yourself. You're going to have to change this because I, there's, I, just, I, I don't need some weak religion that's going to put a bunch of rules on me that I can't keep. And so I just kind of surrendered completely. And I think that there, there's a difference. You know, some people don't. I mean, there are entire theologies built on the fact that if you come to God and you just do what he says to do, he's going to make you well, healthy and wealthy and wise, you know. And that's disgusting, honestly. You know, because God doesn't owe us anything. I mean, here we are, you know, literally like a mouse in your house. If you had a mouse in your house, would you be so overjoyed that that cute little creature's living in your house with you? It, it does, it's an irritant, it's an enemy, right? And so you do things, you go down and you buy ammunition, mouse traps and sticky traps and snappy traps or whatever you need to do to destroy the life of that enemy in your house that's there unwelcomed. And that's where we that's who we are in God's world. Somebody who is a foul revolt, somebody who's diseased and spreading disease to other people, like a dog with rabies in your yard playing with your kids. Oh, it's cute. I wish I could save it, but it needs a bullet in the head because it has rabies that's going to kill my kids, right? I mean, it's just one of those things. And 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 yet God sees us in his world as, as diseased and foul and sinful and, and haters of God. And yet he still shines his light into our lives and says, while you're still sinners, while you're still my enemy, I'm going to die for you. And if you will come and, and give yourself to me, then I will forgive you of your sin. It's, it's incredible. It's incredible. It would be easier for God just to destroy us all. But he's patient and long-suffering that he would allow us to live and that he, because he knows in the midst of all the evil that's in the world and all that the enemy has done to ravish mankind and all that man has done to destroy himself and destroy each other, that there will be a Job, that there will be somebody like you who will rebel against their nature and say, no, I'm going to accept Christ. Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you, verse 10, have you not made a hedge about him around his household, and around all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. So notice, Satan's been looking for an angle to get to Job for some time. He, he's done some inspection. He knows there's a hedge about this guy. There is on every side, not just him, but his family, his possessions, on every side. I've looked for a way in, but there's a hedge about him. Now he's not talking about a shrubbery hedge. You know, Satan's not scared of shrubs. You know, what, what Satan is saying is that there is angelic protection for this guy. Now, I, I've, I've tried to get in. I've tried to get one of his kids. No, there is, there is a, a guard about this guy's life. Isn't it nice to know that God puts a, a hedge of protection around those people that are his? He gives angels, his angels charge over us. Nothing can come against us at all unless God allows it. 
That should be a comfort for us to know. That everything that touches your life, every evil that comes in, it is not only allowed by God, but allowed for your perfection. And when I say perfection, I don't mean perfection in the way that we mean perfection, but I mean maturity, growth in your relationship with God. Everything he allows, whether it be a difficult circumstances, a financial crisis, a dramatic change, COVID-19, whatever he has allowed, he has allowed that you might become stronger or better or serve as some wonderful example. Isn't that exciting tonight? Because that's exactly what would happen with Job. So Satan sees God's protection. He sees God's provision. He sees God blessing Job and says, that is why Job loves you. No other reason, only because you've blessed him so much. Blames God for, or blames Job for being a fair weather believer. You remember we talked about the accuser of the brethren? He's accusing Job that if you took those things away from Job, he, he, he wouldn't love you the way he does. I used to worry about this in people's lives. I remember, you know, being a young pastor, I'd hear about the person who, who lost their child or got a diagnosis or found out some horrible news or their business tanked or they were being sued. And I remember thinking as a young pastor, I remember thinking, oh no, are they going to be mad at God? Oh no, are they gonna are they gonna lose their faith because this is happening to them? And really, I, I guess as just somebody who was inexperienced and immature, I was just selling them short because what ends up happening is I come to these people and I'm sitting with them at the hospital or I'm I'm talking to them, and more than not, and this is I'm not saying this always is the case, but more than not, they're not blaming God, but they're sitting there comforting me being comforted by their comfort that they'd received because they're saying, I couldn't have made it through this if I didn't have the Lord. I mean, what, what an amazing thing that is. I mean, tragedy's unthinkable, and, and I couldn't have gone through this if I wouldn't have had the Lord. It's usually people we find saying, why would God allow this to happen to me? Are people that really have no knowledge of God at all. You know, people who you go to their house because somebody's died, they've never been to church or they don't go to church. They've written off God a long time ago and now they're mad at God because something bad happened in their life. But it's usually people that are walking with the Lord that cling to him in those times. But he says, verse 11, and this is where it gets chilling. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. So if you take away all that you've given him, he won't love you. He, he is only there. He's only faithful to you because you've blessed him so much. And this is where it gets very, very, very chilling. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person, so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, th why did God say don't lay a hand on his person? Because later on, he's going to. He's going to give him permission to. Well, why did God, because Satan didn't blame him of that. He didn't say, well, only because he's healthy. He, he left that out. So God only gave Satan what he asked for. Everything. All that you've given him. All the blessings you've given him. And I'm sure this wasn't easy for God because God knows how merciless the devil is. And he is never going to be your friend. He hates you with a cruel, wicked hatred that is darker than you could possibly ever imagine. And yet it, what was important was that the devil could see what a powerful, important relationship that God had with Job. And that nothing could sever that. I love what Paul says, whether life nor death nor angels nor principalities or powers nor dominions or nakedness or whatever, all those things. He says, nothing can separate us from the love of God is in Christ Jesus. I talked about that on Sunday. I think that it's, it's so true. You know, you see these people who've lost everything in their life, and yet when they have God still, they have everything that's worth living for. 
you know, and yet you see so many people that are wealthy. You know, you look at the, you know, just, I mean, I don't know if you ever watched those news shows where they talk about all the, you know, the, the Hollywood people who are in rehab again, and this guy tried to take his life, and they had everything that life could possibly foist upon a person, money, fame, influence, power, whatever the person could have ever wanted, and they're miserable. And yet you find these people who have nothing, you know, in this world, you know, missionaries who live in Uganda, who live in a hut, you know, to, to minister to people who are, you know, in darkness and and don't know Jesus, and they share Jesus with them, and they give up their lives to live this life and the joy that they have, you know? I mean, it's such a contrast. People who give up their life love life when they give it up for God, and people who try to get their life lose their life. Didn't somebody say something about that once? If you try to lose your, if you lose your life, you'll gain it, but if you try to find your life, you'll lose it. You know, somebody like Jesus said that. But what a powerful lesson for us, too. Verse 13, it says, Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking their wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing, the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabaeans raided them and took them away, indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone escaped to tell you. So he had farming taking place. They're out there plowing these 500 uh, um, yoke of oxen, so a thousand oxen are plowing. He has all his donkeys there too. Half of his wealth, the Sabaeans come and and take it all away, kill all of his servants in a, in one moment. A lot of people in one moment, just uh, even a, a few like a month ago, you know, the stock market started to go down. A lot of people in one moment lost half of their wealth over the last month. Forty. Some days, however long this thing's been going on, a lot of people haven't been able to work at all. They're losing their business. People are losing their house. They just opened up evictions again in Idaho. So now if you, you didn't get your stimulus or whatever and you couldn't pay your rent, then people can be evicted. And, of course, there's those landlords who have all these houses that they, they can't pay their bills because the renters aren't paying. And so it's just this huge cycle of, of horror that people are going through right now. And this is what happened to Job. In, in a moment, he lost half of his wealth. But then another moment, verse 16, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, the fire of God fell up from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I have alone escaped to tell you. So now God is, has removed his protection, and, 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 and Job sees that God's been protecting me, and now his protections, I mean, these raiders have been out there forever. Why now? Now they've taken his, his, you know, why wouldn't God protect me? And then all of a sudden now, all of a sudden these, this fire from heaven comes down. Lightning, I don't know if it was lightning and burnt the field and all the sheep got burned up and the servants trying to save them got killed too. One guy escaped. Fire from God. How can the devil do fire from God? Well, you see the devil controlling the environment, you know, sometimes. You, you see that Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves, Remember? And in, in the book of Revelation, you'll see that the, the Antichrist and false prophet, they call down fire from heaven. You know, there's, there's false signs and wonders, but Satan seems to have power. He's the prince of the power of the air, I guess. That maybe that's what that means. But he loses half his wealth. Now he loses another quarter of his wealth. Verse 17, while he was speaking, another also came. Said the Chaldeans have formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. So there goes the rest of his material wealth. He has three servants that are left and probably not in good shape. Verse 18, while he was still speaking, another came and also said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they were dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. So in a moment, Job would have gladly lived with just losing all of his wealth. He would have given everything he had for what he just lost in that moment to save his children. I can't even imagine. I've, I've sat with people who have lost children. I can't even understand that pain to think of losing a child but more so to think of losing 10 children all of your children in one blow has to be unthinkable 
the pain and the sorrow and the anguish because, you know, you lose your wealth and, you know, you, you work to build it the first time and, you know, you kind of have this idea, well, I can, you know, build it again or I can get back on my feet. But when you lose a child, it's priceless. There's nothing that can replace that. Entirely different thing to lose something that cannot be replaced. And, and, and if that wasn't bad enough, his children are dead, but he didn't lose his wife. And she's going to later on tell him, curse God and die. Now, think about this. I don't know. If all my children died, to watch my wife suffer that loss would just add to the pain immensely. You know, to think of losing my wife is horrible, but to watch her suffer in a way almost seems worse. And then for her to turn on me in her anguish and understanding she's in so much pain, it's just part of Satan's plan to make this as hard as possible on Job. And and it won't even be that. It will also be his friends who are also godly men who will come alongside him and say, there must be sin in your life and that's why you're suffering. To, To... try to make sense out of something they do not understand and and we don't understand when people when bad things are happening the worst thing that we can do is to start to speculate even if we think it's sanctified speculation you know to to say oh well is there sin in your life you haven't confessed and you know you, you, that's why you're you got this cancer or something like that how wicked do we find ourselves end up being the pawn of the devil to put pressure on people who are suffering unimaginably in the midst of that, you know, it's just, it's just the work of the enemy. And yet, sadly, this, this stuff happens all the time. People get sick and they get cancer or something like that, and those people come out of the woodwork to tell people that they just have unconfessed sin in their life and they just need to repent, and if they just repented, then they'd be healed. And how sad it is when that person you know, even tries to think of something you know, that, they've, that they've done, you know, and tries to figure out why they're not right with God, if that's true. And, you know, and wouldn't you, if you were dying and to think of something, is there something? I, I don't know. And then to find them, you know, they die and, and the whole family's devastated. And Job isn't even given someone to blame in this. You know, the the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans, you know, you can blame them, but it was the wind that killed his children. The fire from heaven that killed the sheep. Now, what is his response going to be? This is amazing. Verse 20, And Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. Think of what Job could have done. Job could have gone and gotten a weapon and taken his own life, which would have been an easy escape in the midst of his pain. He didn't plan a revenge. He didn't become John Rambo. He didn't shake his fist at God. He didn't blame God or accuse God. Why did you do this to me? Or why did you allow this? Haven't I been good? He tore his robe. He shaved his head. He fell on the ground. And he worshiped. I don't know that there could be a more pure worship than what Job did at that moment. I think of Abraham. You know, it's it's interesting, the story of Abraham and Isaac. And he, he goes knowing for three days that Isaac is to be offered as a burnt offering and he tells the young men who are there with them, the, the servants that are with them, he says, stay here, and the lad and I are going to go yonder to worship, to lay down everything before God. I mean, you think about a man who thinks that God is requiring him to sacrifice his own son. He says, I'm going to worship. I don't think we think of that when we think about worship. I think we think about being in the, in the congregation with our hands up in the songs, our favorite song, and, oh, I love this part. I love this part. I can't wait. <gasps> you know, and we sing it, and we're just like, oh. 
But worship becomes real when everything in our life has been trashed and everything is going downhill and we don't know what the future is going to hold. At the risk of being cliche, but we know who holds the future. And we get on our knees and we say, God, you are in control. I don't understand this, but you do. And I worship you in spite of all the pain that's in my heart and all that's going on in my head. And he said, this is what Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Wow. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He's taking everything away from me. Everything that, that I've, I've, I've held dear. And I'm watching my wife. No doubt Job loved his wife. He's watching her suffer or, or thinking. Maybe she's not there and he hasn't seen her yet. But he's thinking, what is she going to respond? How is she going to respond to this? In verse 22, in all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. That's supernatural. That's love. That's somebody who has sat in the presence of God. This man who is wealthy with family, wealthy with goods, but none of that wealth was there for him in the midst of his deepest trial, but the wealth that he did have that was there for him through that deepest trial, his wealth in his relationship with God. And that is the one wealth that we can never lose. The one net wealth, and if we have that wealth, we, we will have all the wealth we ever need. And it is with that wealth, that spiritual relationship with God, where we know God and God knows us, and we're following him and worshiping him and acknowledging him in all of our ways, that we find that we can have all the things that would destroy us if we tried to worship them, such as children and houses and wives and her husband, or you know, all the things that don't satisfy in and of themselves until we have known God and worshiped Him first. And when we know Him, and we're in relationship with him, we find that we have everything. Not just him, but all the things that he gives us. Abraham, you know, I love how Tozer puts that in his, in his book, The Pursuit of God, The Blessedness of Possessing Nothing. He says, was not this, this, poor, this poor man who, who, who possessed nothing rich, did he not have everything after he sacrificed or went to sacrifice his son? And, and he, he ended up having his son back because God says, don't lay your hand on the boy. And he still had camels and herds and and all that wealth. And yet he possessed nothing but God. God was his possession. And so it was with Job, and so it should be with us. That God becomes the thing that we live for, the thing, the one that we love supremely. And we find that, you know, when we do find ourselves in that place of loving God supremely, we find that he is the one thing and the only thing in this life that truly satisfies the soul. That one relationship is the one thing that truly makes us feel fulfilled. In his presence is fullness of joy, right? And pleasures at his right hand forevermore. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this amazing story of Job. A man who, who loved you, who feared you, who shunned evil in his life and and walked uprightly before other people. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would see you the way that he did. We have so much more light than Job had. I mean, as far as we can tell, we have your word, Old Testament, New Testament. We have the book of Job. We can read about his experiences. Certainly those things are written for our learning. Lord, I just pray that you would help us, Lord, to have that same relationship through your son, Jesus, that we would walk with you, that we would know you, and Lord, that you would just use us, Lord, for your glory in this life, and that we would see you, Lord, in every circumstance, walking with us, leading us, Lord, and that we, like Job, would never charge you with wrong, Lord, 
knowing that you work all things together for good to those who love you. So help us love you, Lord. Help us to walk with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand?
May the Lord bless you guys. Um, and uh, if you're watching with us, I just want to let you know we're going to be um, running some slides. So if you want to see what's coming up in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, we're going to be running slides so you can see what's coming up as well as um, just saying hi online. So if you want to say hi to other people, I encourage you to do that. You can go to our website at ccm.org and um, find out more information about the church and other podcasts. If you go to media, you can find um, previous studies and um, things, current studies as well. Um, God bless you guys. Thank you guys that are here, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Love each other on the way out um, as you keep social distance. <laughs> <laughs>